The concluding denunciation is uh, the closing message of the journey with Jonah in keeping with the other titles of these messages that we've looked at from chapter 1, verse 1, all through uh, these four chapters now. Uh, when we come to chapter 4 and this message right now, as we looked last week at the crushing displeasure and how that Jonah was displeased with what God had been doing. Now, the whole city had uh, come to repentance, if you will. Uh, the whole city had gotten things right with the Lord. And here you find the prophet, uh, the preacher, if you will, he's disappointed with the results. As I said to you in that last message, if, if everybody got right with God at El Bethel in Cherokee County, I surely wouldn't be disappointed. I'd be pleased and I'd be thanking God for that. You can, you can be assured of that. But not Jonah, not Jonah. Uh, he voices his displeasure concerning what God had done in Nineveh. Now we come to chapter four, verse four. After Jonah has voiced his displeasure, now God, he speaks in, in a way, and I've got it termed like this. Jehovah now speaks and he speaks to Jonah with denunciation. Well, you say, well, preacher, the title of this message, the concluding denunciation. What does denunciation really mean? Well, in the conclusion of this chapter, you find this word denunciation, which means this. It means to condemn. It means to criticize, to scold, or to speak with reproof. And that is exactly what Jehovah God is now doing. Jonah has spoken to God of his displeasure. Now Jehovah speaks with a denunciation toward Jonah. In other words, he condemns him. He scolds him. He speaks with reproof. It kind of reminds me of chapter 1. Now, I'm not going back to chapter 1 and preaching again chapter 1 this morning. I was thinking about this as I put it in my notes, but you remember back in chapter 1 when there was the call of duty. God calls him at the very first there in verses 1 and 2. Jonah, I want you to arise and go down to Nineveh and and preach to that great city uh, for their wickedness has come up before me. He said, I want you to go preach the message. And he gave him the message later on. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Well, if you remember, right after verse 2, the Bible says, but Jonah in verse 3. And then in verse 4, it's but the Lord. And if you remember and recall in those messages, I I, I made the statement, Jonah is trying to get in a budding contest with God, like a head-budding contest, so to speak. And as I, I made reference to that, I thought about that here again because in this concluding denunciation, Jonah has spoken with displeasure. Now God, Jehovah God, speaks with denunciation to Jonah. And uh, you'll find, and I'll say this probably toward the end of the message, but if I don't say this at the end of the message, I want to say it now so that you get it. Listen, God is always going to get the last word. I've got a friend of mine that uh, we talk quite often, and when he, we talk and sometimes he'll say, pray for me, i say, what's going on? He'll say, well, my wife. And I've just been spatting a little bit. He said, but there's one thing I've learned after all these 20 some odd years uh, of marriage. He said, one thing that I've learned, and that is that my wife is always going to get the last word in. She's going to make sure of it. <laughs> and well, we, we, we had a good conversation. We always laugh about those things. And, and he is right. I've been around and I, I, he is right. She's going to get the last word in. Well, let me say something to you. Jonah voices displeasure. But then Jehovah brings about a denunciation. He scolds Jonah. And as I say, Jehovah God will get the last word. But if you remember in chapter 1, they had that budding contest one with another. You remember after God gives him that opening call of duty to go down to Nineveh? The Bible said, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But in the very next verse, verse 4 of chapter 1, The Bible said, but the Lord sent a great wind into the sea. And of course, he sent that mighty storm. If you ever try to get into a budding contest with God, you are going to lose. And as I say again, Jehovah gets the last word. 
And so here in this passage, Jonah speaks and then Jehovah speaks. And it goes back and forth, back and forth. And of course, this undesirable attitude and the unending actions of this rebellious and this this running uh, saint of God who ran from the Lord and he got right with the Lord in the belly of the great fish and now he goes and preaches this message. But he still has a bad attitude after God has done so many great things. Does it remind you of some Christians that we might know? God, God blesses the church. Great things are going. But preacher, well, you know we got this problem over here. Always going to find something to say about something. Well, Jonah's attitude and his actions were everything and anything but pleasant. He showed his displeasure. Now God uses his expressions. God uses his examples to try to bring Jonah back in. He wants to rein him back in. And let me say this to you. I'm thankful for a merciful and loving God. That when we try to uh, rebel or when we try to express ourselves or give examples in our own life of how that we run from God and do things that's not right, even God still tries to do everything He can to pull us back in. In other words, He, he, he and I'll, I'll give you this in just a moment, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but God, Jehovah God, tries to reason with Jonah. But Jonah refused the reasoning and so God brings the rod. And we'll see a little bit more about that. So, uh, many times when you think about, uh, when you think about sin, here, here, here God is having to deal with Jonah and his expressions and examples of a, of a bad attitude and, and actions that are not good as we'll see in the scriptures. But by way of introduction, I, I think about this. When we think about sin, most of the time we think about bad sins and big sins. We'll say, well, Drinking. The old preachers you saw, this drinking, smoking, dancing, gambling's got to stop. You know, that's the way the old preachers would preach it. You know, that's the way they did. Am I telling the truth? But you think about drinking, you think about uh, immorality, you think about uh, maybe lying or stealing and, and all these types of things, abuse, physical abuse. You say, oh, those are big sins. Those are big sins. But invariably we overlook things like a wrong spirit in an individual is not being that bad. When a wrong sinful spirit inside of a saint of God is just as bad as drinking and lying and cheating and stealing and robbing God and all these other... I mean, it's just as bad as all these other sins that we might think are big sins. Having a bad, wrong spirit inside of you And so when you think about this, this is exactly what Jonah had. He was displaying a wrong spirit. Let me say something to you, El Bethel Baptist Church, Christians. As a church collectively, as a Christian individually, as our families, uh, as a church family and also our individual families, I believe the Lord could do a whole lot inside this church and with this church and for this church and for your family and for yourself individually if we had just get our spirit right. You say, well, well, I don't go out and I don't crowd around. I don't drink. I don't do all these other things. I don't drug. I don't do all these other things that you talked about. I've got none of those things, those big sins. I've got none of those sins. But what about a bad spirit? That's just as bad. And that's where Jonah is. He's not doing anything bad as far as what the world calls it. And and sometimes we preach about certain things and name certain things. No, he actually has a bad spirit. His temperament, his, his, his wrongful, sinful spirit is just sitting there pouting because God has done great things. And we'll see it as this message begins to unfold. And I, I think about that. If we would, listen to me, if we would just get our spirit right, What kind of a miracle revival that God could send to America and to this church and to all of our lives, to our families, if we would just deal with our spirit? What type of spirit do we have today? I like what the psalmist said. You know when the psalmist David committed that immorality and and, uh, he committed adultery with Bathsheba, you know in that uh, 51st chapter, uh, in that 51st chapter there uh, of the book of Psalms, He said in in that essence, and I like the verse there, verse number 10, he said, Create in me a clean heart, O God. That was confession of sin. But he didn't stop there. You see, sometimes we say, Oh, I'm just going to confess my sin and everything will be all right. But he went on to say, And renew a right spirit within me. 
He said, not only do I need cleansing, but I need some conforming going on. I need a renewing. I need a regeneration of my own spirit because my spirit is not what it ought to be. And so as we begin to open up this, let's pay close attention to a spiritful, a, a, a sinful, wrong spirit. That, that sinful spirit that could be inside of us. Ask God to cleanse us of that as well. So let's look at verse uh, number four. Would you look at it? Every, got it? Say amen. amen. Verse number four. I'm going to put this shield. We're going to look at Jehovah's reasoning. Jehovah's reasoning. In verse number four, here's what he said. After Jonah speaks, here's Jehovah God. Then said the Lord, that's Jehovah God, doest thou well to be angry? Now this is in the form of a question. He speaks to Jonah. I've entitled this first major point, Jonah's reasoning. Now, or Jehovah's reasoning. What is Jehovah's reasoning? He is trying to search out some sensibleness in Jonah. He said, you're going about things the wrong way. You've got that wrongful spirit. And so he said, doest thou well to be angry? Now, in Jehovah's reasoning, searching for sensibleness, there's two items I look at concerning, first of all, his health. And then secondly, concerning his hatred. You say, where do you get that in this one little verse, in this question? Doest thou well to be angry? Look at the word well. That word well in the scripture has to do with your physical well-being. It has to do with your health. And he said, you've got a bad spirit, and I could preach an entire message on this, and may someday, but listen to me. If you've got a bad spirit, it'll affect you physically. The Bible talked about that root of bitterness, that bitter spirit uh, in the book of Hebrews. And he said, doest thou well? So he's trying to reason with Jonah. Why are you so angry? Why do you hate them so badly? Well, of course, I told you in the one, some of the very first messages, uh, the, the folks of Nineveh were, were, well, they were cruel. History tells us they'd cut their heads off, and man, they'd use them like bowling balls, you know. They'd do all kind of crazy things. Uh, they really, they were really cruel to the Jewish people. And Jonah knew that. That's why he didn't want to go in the first, the first place. But God had given him, uh, 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 I, I guess, a, uh, I guess that, that command to go. And God said, I want you to give it. Go. You've got to go. And if God, if God opens up the door, and if God tells us to go, go. Step through the door. Jonah said, I hate him so bad. So he's dealing, he's trying to reason with him. And so he deals with his health. He said, doest thou well? To be angry, he deals with his hatred. So God begins like a doctor to probe in his heart, trying to heal him up. And God tries to reason with Jonah's conscience concerning his health and hatred without having to use the rod of correction. I say this to you, if we do not follow God's reasoning, when God tries to reason with us, he'll eventually use the rod of correction. Are you with me now? Are you hearing me? In other words, if God, if God reasons with us concerning our bad spirit, if God reasons with us and says, hey, listen, you ought to wake up like he did with, with, uh, with Jonah. Jehovah God said, doest thou well to be angry? It's not good for your health. Why do you hate them so bad? He said, are, are, you, are you treating yourself right? And, if, and, and God tries to reason with us. God tries to bring us back in. God tries to corral us back in. But if, if, if he can't reason with us, he'll use the rod of correction. The book of Revelation talks about that. He said, as many as I love, he said, I rebuke. That's the reasoning. And then he said, I chasten. That's the rod. In other words, it's like us dealing with our children sometimes. Don't do that. Do this. Come over here. Sit down. Be quiet. You remember sometimes that mom or grandma or somebody in the family, they would speak to us even when we were that way. Now you better sit over there and behave, son. Don't you do that. Hey. You're to be seen, not to be heard. <laughs> Sit over there. And then the more that we did not follow the reasoning. See, that was reasoning. You said that was them fussing at us. No, they were reasoning with you. And if it didn't, then they took off the old belt. Or they took out and went out and got a limb. That's the rod. And so he said, doest thou well to be angry, Jonah? Jehovah's reasoning with him. He's trying to get some sensible thought into him. But let me say something to you. If you've got a bad spirit, you're not going to be sensible. <laughs> it's going to be hard to reason with you. Come on. You know anybody that's got a hard head? Yeah, I know. Most of you are pointing toward your husband and your wife right now. Eh? 
Well, God reasons with us. He said, as many as I love in Revelation 3.19, He said, I rebuke and chasten. You see, God, 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 you know, God could have taken Jonah out with just one word. Can I give you some news this morning? Are you hearing me? Hey, God could have taken us out. He could have already taken you and me out with just one word. But yet Jonah is finding out that he's slow to anger, as verse number 2 said, and he's of great kindness. And so God reasons with Jonah in order to turn him around rather than trying to use the rod of correction. But Jonah again displays that spirit uh, of, of rebellion. He's not listening. Uh, he should have repented when he was rebuked by the Lord, but he's rebelling and now he's going to suffer the consequences of correction. And of course, he's very angry. We know that he's angry. Jehovah God is confronting his anger. He's also condemning his attitude. Jonah's anger was not justified in all of this. We know this. His anger was only motivated by his own selfishness. And so God tries to get Jonah to examine and evaluate his attitude and his actions. And that's exactly what God tries to do for each and every one of us. When we become displeased or disgruntled with the things that are going on in our life, Sometimes we are prone to have wrong motivations in what we do. Somebody said one time about saints of God, uh, they're just pouting Christians instead of shouting Christians. Just pout. Got their lips stuck out all the time. Do you pout? Are you pouting now? When things don't go our way, stick the lip out. Our little grandson, you know, there's a couple of times and he... When I don't know why he goes through, they go through these stages, and I know what's happening because I saw it with our son. But when you would try to change them, and he's, you know, I'd lie him down on the bed or the couch, wherever I'm going to change him, and he starts kicking his legs. Well, you can't change a diaper when somebody's kicking their legs. And I just got onto him like I said, "Son, stop that!" I almost cried. First time I saw him, really. Papa's got on to me. You know, that's what he's thinking in his little head. Pout. When a, when a Christian becomes displeased or disgruntled with the way things are going, they'll become a pouting Christian rather than a shouting Christian. They're, they're, one, that, they're one that has a sour spirit rather than a sweet spirit. And nothing good can come of that. And so Jonah, Jehovah is reasoning with Jonah. Now let's look at verse 5. Here's number 2. You've got Jehovah's reasoning. He's searching for sensibleness, but now you got Jonah's response. What happened? He's straying with selfishness. What does he do in verse number 5? Also, it kind of reminds us of chapter 1, doesn't it? Notice what happened. So Jonah went out of the city. Here he is running again. Isn't it amazing? He's already been in the belly of the fish. He's got all that gook on him. He's repented and gotten spitting out, goes down and preaches and God blesses, and now here he is again running. He goes out of the city. The Bible said he sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. Now we're going to look at several different things under Jonah's movement. His movement. He's, he's stubbornly moving with selfishness. He's straying and leaving. So we're going to look at number one, his movement. Then we're going to look at his making and his motive in verse five. Let's look at his movement. Well, God had just asked him. Jehovah God had just asked Jonah a question in verse 4. Doest thou well to be angry? Now look at verse 5. Here's his response. He rises up. He gets up. He goes out of the city, the Bible tells us. So Jonah went out of the city. He sat on the east side of the city. In other words, he's fleeing. So he fails to answer God's question. And he, he fled away to avoid God's question. So his response reveals that he's still in displeasure. He's still in a deplorable state of mind and he disrespects God and he refuses to answer his question. And so he moves to the east side of the city. Now let me just give you something here geographically. On the east side of the city, there was a higher terrain and so Jonah knew that from the layout of the land up near the Tigris there. And so Jonah goes up on the east side on the highest terrain of, of, of Nineveh area and he goes up there and the Bible makes this very specific. There's a lot there that could be preached concerning the east side and why and all. But he goes up here so he can look down on the city. 
As I'm standing on the platform here, I'm looking down on the congregation. I see you, and I'm able to see all of you. When I'm down on the floor, I can't see everyone like I can when I'm up here. So Jonah goes up on the east side. He's wanting to see. The Bible said he goes up there, and in his movement as he flees, and he, and he, and he fled, and he failed to answer Jehovah's question. But notice his making. What did he make, and why did he make it? Well, verse number 5 said, Jonah went out of the city, and he sat on the east side of the city, and there he made a what, church? A booth. And the Bible said that he sat under it in the shadow. So what did he make? He made a shelter. Why did he make it? He had to have a shade there. And so we see his actions here speak to us concerning his condition, not only physically, but spiritually. It was hot up there. He was never told to go out of the city. But that's his response to God's question. So when God asked him a question, Hey, Jonah, doest thou well to be angry? Doest thou well to, uh, to be angry? What about your health? What about your hatred? Are you well to do all of this? Are you, you know, is it going to uh, help your well-being to be this angry? He said, I'm not going to answer God's question. I'm going to run. And so he goes up to the east side of the city. And he goes up on that high terrain. He's looking down on the city. And, and what he's really doing, lest I forget later on, what Jonah is really doing, and he's looking down... And he's saying, I know you forgave him, God, but I'm still waiting for judgment. I know that you uh, was a forgiving, slow to anger, merciful, kind. He said, but I'm still waiting for judgment. That's what he's doing there. He goes up there. He's making. So he builds something. You know, let me say something. God never told him to build anything. Can you see yourself in this little verse here? See, God didn't tell him to do that, but he did it anyway. Now, there's nothing wrong with building a little hut when you're out in the sun, but God never told him to go out of the city. He just asked him a question. Doest thou well to be angry? But Jonah went away. He left. He avoided and he failed to answer God's question. In other words, he's disrespecting God. And he's leaving out and he goes up in the city. He makes him a booth. God didn't, hey, God didn't call Jonah to be a manufacturer. He called him to be a messenger. Amen? I've told you this many years, uh, some, some time ago, but many years ago, uh, you know, I went to, I went to hairstyling school. I was going to be a hairstylist. I said, and you know what? Let me, let me just, let me just, just, just calm down. Here was my, are you hearing me now? Here was my thinking. I think this will fit well right here in the message. Here was my thinking. Here was my thought process. No matter where God sends me in this world. Okay. Unless it was some, tribal company, uh, country, you know, out in the wilderness somewhere. But I had this, this was my thoughts. Wherever God may send me, if I can uh, become a, a barber and hairstylist, I said, I can fix hair and support myself. Now that, that's, that's a logical thing. I was looking at supporting myself. I said, you know, if churches fail to send support over there, if churches get, you know, get mad at me and don't want to send their support as a missionary, I can somewhere, if I've got a trade of some sort, I can actually cut hair, style hair, and make a living at it. Is that not sensible now? Now you understand, so don't laugh again. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with me. And the guy who was doing the training, he told me, he said, he said, with, with your, with, 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 you know, I guess the way that you conduct yourself around people, he said, your energy, he said, man, there's no telling how much money you can make. That's what he told me. He and his wife were the ones running the, uh, running the uh, school. He said, fella, I'm telling you, man, he said, you, you just got such a good attitude. You, you, you know, everybody seems to like you. And it, you know, he said, man, you can make all sorts of money. He said, you can tell them people they look good, whether they look good or not, and they'll give you that money. Said, Thank you. <laughs> and I was thinking, ching, 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 ching. You look wonderful, beautiful. But I never will forget my pastor looking at me and said, God didn't call you to be a Delilah boy. He called you to preach. You see, here's Jonah. He goes out to the east side. He's going up there. He left the city. God asked him a question. Doest thou well to be angry? The Bible said he went out of the city and went on the hillside to see what would happen as he's making a machine. And he builds him a booth for a shade, a shelter. God didn't tell him to do that. 
God didn't call him to be a manufacturer. He called him to be a messenger to give the gospel of Jesus Christ, see? You say, well, why, why would God be upset with him doing that? Hey, listen, you may try to do things your own way, but you have to do things God's way, plain and simple. So he's making. Now, look at his motive. His motive, <laughs> he was sitting in rebellion is what he was doing. And he was not sitting, only sitting in rebellion. The Bible said he sat under in the shadow. So he sat under it, that boot that he just made, in the shadow. Now here is his motive also, not only to sit in rebellion, but to see retribution. Till he might see what would become of the city. So he moves out in his motive and he makes this booth. He wasn't supposed to. His position of sitting in rebellion and his purpose of seeing for retribution, as I've got in my notes here and as I see in the Scripture there, he was initially sitting there. He was waiting to see if there wouldn't be some judgment that God would send on Nineveh. See, God had told him the message, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be over what? Thrown, destroyed. He said, I know that they got right, but maybe God will still destroy some of them. That's what type of a spirit that Jonah had. He said, somehow, some way, sometime, maybe judgment will fall. Look at verses 6, 7, and 8, would you? Verses 6, 7, and 8. We've seen Jonah's reasoning, verse 4. He's searching for sensibleness. Jonah's, uh, uh, Jehovah's reasoning. Now Jonah's response, straying in selfishness. And now you come to Jehovah's reaction again. So I, I've told you over and over again, it's, it's Jehovah, Jonah, Jehovah, they're going back and forth. Now here's Jehovah's reaction. His reaction is very specific and strategic. And the Lord, verse number 6, the Lord God prepared. Notice verse 7. But God prepared. Verse 8 again. God prepared. Three times God prepares in these verses. 6, 7, and 8. Jehovah's reaction was very specific and strategic. Notice the specific preparation. In verse number 6, he prepares a gourd. In verse number 7, he prepares a worm. Verse number 8, he prepares a wind. I see this as a shadow and, of course, security because verse number 6 says it like this, And the Lord, that's Jehovah, the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head. Now notice what God's even doing for him. How merciful and how gracious God is. To deliver him from his grief. In other words, to deliver him from his bad spirit. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. He wasn't glad of God. He was glad of the gourd. You see the bad spirit in Jonah? Verse 7. Notice again his strategic and specific, if you will, his specific pre preparation. He prepares a worm in verse number 7 now. When the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd, that it withered. And it came to pass, in verse number 8, when the sun did arise, that God prepared a vehement uh, east wind. <laughs> He's in the east, on the east side of the city, so God sends an east wind. And when He does that, the sun begins to beat upon His head. The Bible said that He fainted and wished in Himself. Notice here now in verse 8, He wished in Himself to die. And He said, it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah's reasoning, or Jehovah's reasoning, we saw Jonah's response and now here Jehovah's reaction. He prepares this gourd. Of course, Jonah looks at this gourd. He's exceeding glad of this gourd. I look at the gourd and I see it as a shadow or security, if you will, because of what God said. He said, I want to deliver him from his grief in verse 6. But then God prepares a worm. <laughs> and let me say this to you. Just like we said in chapter 1 those first messages if we run and rebel against God he can prepare a great fish. Is that not what he said in chapter 1? And the Lord prepared a great fish. It was an assignment assigned just for John and now he prepares a gourd. Hey listen whether it's a great fish or a gourd God can prepare it. But then here he also prepares, I call this the soldier. That worm comes in and he destroys that gourd. 
in one night. And then he sends another, he sends another storm, which is the wind. So you've got, you've got his specific preparation. Now notice his strategic annihilation because of Jonah's prideful affection. The Bible said that, boy, he was exceedingly glad. He's exceeding glad of the gore. See, he had his affection in the wrong place. When God delivers us sometimes, we may be thankful for the wrong things. Here he is. He's showing affection, prideful affection. He's exceeding glad for the gourd, not God. I want to tell you what, if you've got anything, it's because of God. If we, if, we, if we have any achievements in our life, if there's anything successful in our life, it is because of God. But yet he's exceeding glad over the gourd. And so he has a prideful affection. He has a poor appreciation. After God displays graciousness and goodness toward him, uh, this unthankful, selfish, stubborn saint, yet he, he, if you will, he spurns all of that. He laughs in the face of God, so to speak, as God has been good. Now let's lose Jonah's regression. Verse number 9. Would you look at it? Verse 9. We've seen Jehovah's reasoning, Jonah's response, Jehovah's reaction. Now let's look at Jonah's regression. Back and forth, as I said. Here's his stubbornness. Verse 9. And God said to Jonah, here again, here's another question. Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? Now see, when God destroyed it with that worm, that little soldier worm that came there and destroyed it, He's exceeding glad of it. He said, are you angry now because of what's happened to the gourd? God didn't allow you to move in this direction. Are you going to get angry about it? God didn't allow you to accomplish this in your life. Are you going to get angry with it? He said, doest thou well to be angry at the gourd? Notice what he says here. And he said, here's what John replies. Now it's an amazing now. In verse number 5, when God asked him the question, do I well to be angry? The Bible said he, he went out of the city. Did he not? He avoids and he doesn't answer. So he fails to answer and he fled to avoid the question. But now Jonah answers. He's gotten so mad. He said, okay, God, let me put it to you like this. Yeah, I do well. It's good for me. It's the right thing for me. To be angry. And here's what he said. Even unto what? Death. Wow. You see, unlike Jonah's response in verse 4 to that question, in verse 5 he leaves and goes out of the city. Now here he is in verse number 9. He said, okay, God, I'll answer you. Yeah, I'm right for being angry. I've dealt with some Christians who have had some things happen in their life and here's what they said. I got a right to feel that way. I got a right to do that. It's my right to be able to feel this way. To react this way. And that's exactly the wrongful spirit that we saw back in his displeasure and here in the concluding denunciation of this message when God deals with him he said, I got a right to do this. Let me, let, me, let me give it to you like this here. In verse number 9, he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. His answer, it reveals no submission to God. It only reveals stubbornness to God. That wrongful spirit seems to fight to the very end. Oh, yes, I'm going to fight to the very end. You say, why to the very end? Death? He said, God, if you kill me, I'm still angry. Wow. God, if you kill me, I, I don't care what the church thinks. I don't care what the preacher says. I'm still going to do my way. I'm still going to go my way. Somebody put it like this. Evil never gives up easily. Think about this now. Evil never gives up easily. And this is seen in Jonah's answer and his actions, his attitude. Let me just, let me give you something else here. And this is a very good one. A very good quote that I ran across. Sin does not have to have reasons or facts to argue. Let me give that part to you again. Sin, sinfulness, a wrong spirit in a person. Sin 
does not have to have reasons or facts to argue. It simply argues because it's sin. Did you get that? Sin does not have to have a reason. In other words, a wrong spirit does not have to have a reason to argue. It doesn't, it, even if there's facts, it doesn't have to have facts. All it has to do is just argue because it's sinful. And it acts the way it does because it's sinful. When I read that quote, I said, I've got to put it in the message. I said, that'll fit in this message right here in this verse number 9 because that's exactly where I've been in my own life before. When I was rebellious and when I wasn't following the Lord like I ought to do. And I rebelled against Him. And I, I was sitting in the pew, just like you're sitting in the pew this morning. Are you hearing me now? Are you sitting, are you sitting there in the pew? How many of you are asleep? Raise your hand. Six. Ah, lady. I don't know how they can raise their hand while they're asleep. But I sat in the same pews just like you're sitting in and I heard the man of God preach when my heart was far from the Lord and when my heart wasn't just right and I had a little bad spirit inside of me. And you see how I even termed it little bad spirit? You see, we don't want to say it's a big, nasty, rotten spirit, but that's what it is. And I'd sit there and I'd say, the preacher's right. I know the Bible's right but I'm still going to continue on doing my thing, my way. Just, oh, so-and-so said something to me, and my spirit inside me bows up against that. You know what? I don't like you telling me what to do. I don't like you telling me how to live. I don't like you telling me uh, what's right and what's wrong. Because why? Because I'm going to do it my way. I don't have to have reasons or facts. Sin just argues because it's sin. Is that not what we're seeing, what we're seeing in the media today? In the political realm? Facts. I've never seen it like this, man. I don't know if you have. But I mean, it doesn't make any difference if they put it. It's black and white right here. I don't care, but this is the way it is. That's Jonah. He said, you got it right, God. I'm angry, and I'm doing well to be angry. Even if I die, I want to die this way. What a testimony. The stubbornness of sin. As I told you in the beginning of this message, and I'm going to conclude this. I told you in the very beginning, are you hearing me now? I said, Jehovah God will have the last word. I put it on our board this morning on our announcements as it was scrolling. God will always get the last word. He'll get the last laugh. The world and uh, may be laughing at God now, but God will get the last laugh. He'll have the last word. Verses 10 and 11, here's Jehovah's reckoning. Or the recompense, you could call it. A stern scolding. Then said the Lord. It's been back and forth. Jonah's displeased. First couple of verses. Jehovah comes and he responds and asks a question. He tries to reason with Jonah. Jonah, Jonah, Jonah he, he reacts to it. And then he regresses. And now here, Jehovah's reckoning. His recompense. The stern scolding. Then said the Lord, that's Jehovah God, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored. <laughs> you had nothing to do with that gourd. You didn't make that gourd, I did. He said, but you're angry about it. He said, neither madest it grow. In other words, you, did, you didn't do anything to it. John, it's all me. It came up in the night, it perished in the night. And here he said in verse number 11, under this reckoning, this recompense, this scolding. He said, should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand? Somebody said that he, that he could be even talking about the, even the young children, for there are many more adults in that city. A large city. He said, these are walking around, they don't even know their right hand from their left hand. He said, shouldn't I be gracious and good to them? And he even mentions the cattle. And he does it in the form of a question. And also much cattle. He said, you have no, you have no compassion, no concern for anything but yourself. My soul. It's all about Jonah. It's all about you. 
So why was he giving this recompense, this scolding, this, this reckoning here? It was because of his value concerning the plant. <laughs> he said, man, you like the gourd more than anything. It was because of his vision concerning the people of Nineveh. He had no vision for the lost. And he was void of perception. He had an unbalanced affection toward that plant that was outside of Nineveh more than he did the people that was inside of Nineveh. He had an unclear conception of the people and he had an unspiritual perception of what God's pity was for the people of that city. His attitude again, his actions here are of no compassion, no care. And through all of this here again, we, you know what we see? I've got this here in the closing notes of my message this morning. What we're seeing is a clear picture of Christians. So-called Christianity sometimes. So-called people who call themselves Christians. What we're seeing here is a clear-cut picture of how those who claim Christianity, but yet they're casualties. They become casualties of such things like the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, the cares of this world. They get drawn away by all of that. And then they start focusing upon themselves. In conclusion, let me give you this thought in form of a question. What kind of concern do you have for a lost world? Not only what kind of concern do you have for a lost world. Let me give you another question. What kind of commitment do you have to Christ right now? How committed are we to Christ and His church? Our concern, compassion for a lost world. But our commitment to Christ and His church. What motivates us? What excites us in life? All of these things, these questions, if we answer them, and we see this here as far as the answers to these questions that I've asked on what concern we have for the lost world, what commitment do we have for Christ and the church, what motivates us and uh, what excites us in life. Well, all of those things that do excite us and what does concern us, what it does is it tells us who we really are. It tells us who we really are. And as we come to the concluding denunciation, Jehovah tries to reason. Jonah again, boy, just, he responds by running, goes out of the city, still hopes that God pours out vengeance upon them. <laughs> God, I may say I love them, but I hope you just wipe them all out. He regresses. Jehovah comes back and he said, I'm going to do some more things to try to bring you back in. How much more, let me say this, how much more does God have to do to bring us where we need to be? I end again with this thought. The reasoning of God will turn into the rod of correction. The reasoning with our conscience, he's just looking for some sensibleness, right thinking, it will eventually turn into the rod of correction. And when God brings that into your life to get you back on the pattern that you made, you say, preacher, I'm not in gross sin. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not going out doing all those things. Uh, how about your spirit? I was going back over this and this morning and there's so much here. But God reminded me on several things in my life. And I go back up for the last few weeks. Well, since revival. Since the revival. I've not been able to sleep that good. That this old knee just hurts and hurts. and this, I, Just different things. And you say, well, go have it fixed. Well, he told me there's really not nothing that can, you know. He could put me a new knee in there. But he's not necessarily going to stop all this arthritis and hurting. And you know what? God reminded me again. He said, buddy, you're going to do it my way. My way. You say, that's just not the way God does things. Well, you ain't going to convince me of it. Because I had no rhyme or reason that that, that, that happened. I was training. I was doing it. And it just started swelling up. What I'm saying to you is, you do it my way, or you ain't going to do it no way. 
God's reasoning with us. I don't want the rod anymore. I heard enough. Amen. And I'm not saying it always comes in those forms. But I say this to you. If God can't reason with us, He'll bring about a rod of correction. And you say, well, oh, preacher, oh, preacher, I'm getting away with things, I'm doing things. I, oh, I know people that's just, just going on, just going on with their life. And boy, they're not in church, they're not doing right there. Oh, it's going, hey, it ain't over yet. God's going to have the last word. He did here, didn't he? Jonah didn't get the last word. And it's amazing, in conclusion of this denunciation, it's amazing that Jonah pins all these words about himself. Because I don't find anybody else writing it but John. Now, what some may argue about that, and that's fine. But I think John had just pinned the words and put it down. He said, this is exactly how it happened. <laughs> Where are we going to be? What's going to happen in the next few months? Everybody's worried about what's going to happen in the world. What's going to happen? I want to know what's going to happen in our own spirit. Because see, when we come down to die, friend, it's going to depend on how we are. And we're all going to leave this world. What kind of compassion we have? How committed are we? I pray God will help us to stay by the stuff. Father, we love you. Thank you for this time that we've had in the book of Jonah. I pray, Heavenly Father, now that you will touch us and help us. And Lord, take all my words that have been somewhat scattered at times. I pray, God, that you'll take all that and put it together. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the message of this book. Father, I pray that you'll help all of us. As in conclusion, we see this thought of what was just said toward the ending, ending of this. We are Jonah. We are Jonah. Would you help us, Lord? We give you praise now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you?